and turn with me to Psalm chapter 134. Psalm chapter 134. I'm excited to talk about this psalm. And I think the Lord has, has something valuable to offer us tonight in this psalm. Amen. Praise you, Lord. It was interesting uh, how this message kind of sprung upon me. I wasn't looking for it, and I wasn't hunting out a message. It just kind of kind of showed up. You know, sometimes when you just do the right things, the right things show up in your life. That's right. You know, I, I found as a Christian and also as a preacher, I know sometimes it's a struggle to get a message together, but I've noticed if I just have a relationship with God, that messages just come out of me having a relationship with Him. And, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that... That I'm not stressing every week over what I'm supposed to bring because just having a relationship with God gives me words to say. And I, yeah. and I thank Him so much for that. But if you have your Bibles, go to Psalm chapter 134. And we're going to read it. It's just three short verses. It says in verse 1, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth, bless thee out of Zion. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name once again. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you've allowed us to be here tonight to worship you and to lift up your name. We thank you, Father, that you've allowed us to dig into your word. And tonight we pray that you would bless the hearing of your word. Bless this message tonight, God. Holy Spirit, let your presence be around this service and be around your people. We're asking you for your touch. We're asking you for your help to understand tonight what you would have to give us, Lord. And we welcome you. And Holy Spirit, direct my mouth. Help me to know what to say. Think through my mind, Holy Spirit, and give me the words that your people need tonight. I ask you to bless this service, and we thank you that you're here with us, and we thank you for your love and your blessing tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Psalm 134. It's only three short verses, but sometimes you, you don't see the significance in a thing because you think it's too small. Sometimes there's, there's things that God puts in your path, and it's easy to overlook and walk over them, but God oftentimes hides a treasure in something that's small. And tonight I just want to open up by saying that the way that God gave me this scripture, it was pretty random, but I noticed that God's never random. Um, I was getting up and drinking some coffee one morning before work, and Amber was off that day, and I said, Amber, why don't you get out of bed and come over here and read the Bible with me? <laughs> like, get out of that bed and stop laying around. It's time to read the Bible, and you're going to do it with me this morning. And so I got her out of bed. She got her cup of coffee. She sat down beside of me. And I said, well, what do you want to read? And it's the same thing that happens to you in your relationships. Well, I don't know. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you want to read? Well, where are you at in the Bible? Well, let me think. Um, but I said, just give me some random scripture. Just pick a random psalm. And she said, Psalm 134. And so we turned there, and I was like, well, gosh, Amber, that's only three verses. This is going to last for long. <laughs> like, you picked the shortest psalm in all of the Bible. That's great. But what happened is, we read that psalm together, and I came into it thinking, gosh, this is just three verses that are going to say praise the Lord. How, how are we going to build a long-lasting spiritual relationship with each other out of just these three <laughs> measly little verses? And, and I was thinking, God... Please show us something in this. But as we read it, I found that there's treasures hidden just in the simplicity of this Psalm 134. Now I'm going to read it again. Behold, that means look, bless you the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless you out of Zion. So as we read this and I started looking at the scripture, I noticed that God was talking to a group of people who were working night shift. It's funny that you're here, Uncle Matt. My <laughs> Uncle Matt works night shift. I titled the message tonight, Night Shift. And I, and I titled it in a way just meaning that 
A lot of the things that you do in your life that you think carry no weight, have no significance, nobody sees, nobody cares about, I want to tell you tonight up front, God sees where you are, and He sees the little things that you're doing. He sees the small things that nobody else sees. You see in this scripture tonight in verse 1, God's speaking to the people that attend the temple at night. You're thinking everybody's bringing their sacrifices, everybody's doing their big things during the day when the good priests are there, when the, the most holy priests are there. But here we are, God is talking to a group of ministers that are working on the night crew, are working when nobody else is around. I'm not thinking people are going to be bringing many sacrifices at night. So they're kind of sitting there at night thinking, man, you know, I'm really thankful that God allowed me to be in this temple and work for him and do his work. But nobody cares that I'm here. Nobody cares that I'm in this place. Nobody's thinking about me. They think I'm second string, and that's why I'm in the temple tonight. But God is encouraging those in the temple that are working night shift to lift up their hands in the temple, in the sanctuary, and praise the Lord. He's telling you, even in those moments when nobody's watching, even in those moments when you think nobody cares, you still lift up a shout of praise because you have an assurance that your God cares and your God sees you right where you are. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You see... God taught me something here a few years ago, and I've never forgot it. And I'm just going to read you something that he gave me. Success that goes public is always birthed in the private, seemingly monotonous, and mundane tasks that you do each day. Amen. Success with God, success in your life, success in your job that goes public, that everyone notices is birthed in the private, seemingly monotonous, mundane tasks that you do each day. You see, these men were serving in the temple on the night shift. Why? Why were they serving at night? Why did anybody need to be there in the temple at the night shift? And I'll give you the reason. It says in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 9, this is when God is giving the law to Moses and to Aaron and to Israel. And it says in Leviticus 6, verse 8 and 9, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on the top of the altar until the next morning. And the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. The fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. So I wonder, why are these guys working the night shift? Because they got to keep the fire burning. Because if no one's there to tend the fire, it might go out. And I understand from the scripture that the Bible says that God himself is the one that sent the fire. If you look at Leviticus 9 and 24, it talks about how they put a sacrifice on the burnt altar and then God sent fire out of heaven that consumed that sacrifice and it was supposed to burn up and be kept burning until the next morning. So I find that God starts a fire that we have to keep burning in the monotonous, small, insignificant, seemingly unnoticeable things of our life. So to, tonight I want to tell you that those little things that you're doing in your relationship with God are the things that are more significant than the things that everybody sees you do on the outside. Amen. Amen. See, in America we have been trained to think that me standing behind the pulpit, me preaching to you right in this moment is the most important facet of my life. It's important, but it's not the most important thing. Because this season, this thing that I'm doing right now, the thing that Pastor does, the thing that Dave does, the things that others do, whatever God has called you to do, it's going to come out of what you do when nobody is around you. It's going to come through what you do when nobody sees you and nobody hears you and nobody's watching you. 
Have you noticed that the greatest miracles that have come out of your life started with you in the floor crying tears saying, God, I'm all alone and nobody cares. God, I'm trying to push to read your word. God, I'm trying to push to do the right thing in this moment. But I feel like nobody sees me, God. Those seasons are what birth the thing that everybody sees and goes, oh man, praise the Lord, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you did a great job, hallelujah, God is using you. Why? Because you got alone with him when nobody was around. Amen. And I want to talk to the, the part of you that feels like you're just keeping the fire burning on the night shift and nobody cares. I'm here to tell you, God really does care about those that work the night shift in the temple. Because if they don't keep the fire burning, there's not going to be any fire in the morning when the superhero Christians come in to take the scene. You see, if there wasn't somebody watching the fire at night when Aaron and Moses came back in the morning to offer these sacrifices new again to God, there'd be no fire there. And when you let your fire burn out because you think nobody cares, I've noticed that it's a lot harder to get it burning again. Have you noticed in life it's much easier to keep a fire going than to start a fire from scratch? It takes a lot of work to get a fire burning again that has gone out. But if you'll just do those little things in those moments when you feel like it the least... The fire will stay burning so that when you regain your strength, you can go back out and the fire is blazing hot for God. And you can do great things for God. Yeah, amen. Is there anybody in here in, in this season, during this time where people have been quarantined to their house, during this time where you're going to work, you're going home, you're going to work, you're going home, that you think, God, I know you're going to do something, but man, I really want you to do it now. And I feel like... I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels. I pray, God, and, and I feel like my prayer never reaches above the ceiling of my house. I pray, God, and I never feel the goosebumps. I pray, God, and I don't feel your presence just wrapping me up and giving me strength. God, where are you? It's those moments that are the most important moments of your life. Because what you do when you feel nothing determines what God is going to do with you in the future. That's right. You see, God made everybody that ever did anything great for him go through what's called a wilderness season, Amen. where he just feeds you manna from heaven every day. You see, the greatest meal you could ever eat physically was the manna that God supplied Israel. You saw how much strength it gave them. You saw how their clothes didn't wear out, their bodies didn't wear out, because God gave them manna from heaven. But what happens when you keep eating manna every day? I bet you a lot of people in this room like to eat steak or filet mignon. Let's go with a good cut. But I bet you if I gave you filet mignon every day for the next month, you wouldn't want filet mignon anymore, would you? I love cake, but when my mom sends Amber and I home with a big chunk of cake, after I eat all that cake, I don't want any more of that cake. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. So I look at the children of Israel, and here God's sending them supernatural manna that they collect every morning. And they're like, man, I'm sick of eating this manna. I can't negate that it doesn't taste good, but I'm just tired of eating it. And I think the people of God oftentimes in our lives get in a situation where you say, I'm tired of keeping the fire burning, God. I'm tired of kindling the altar in the night hours. I don't want to do this anymore. And you cry out to God like that. And you say, God, I can't do this another day. And guess what you hear from God? Crickets. <laughs> Chirping. God, if you don't move right now, I won't be able to make it. <laughs> and he don't do anything, does he? <laughs> raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. If you're sitting on the camera, you raise your hand to God. Sees you. <laughs> that's what serving God feels like sometimes. But it's in those moments 
When you choose to continue to make the right decision that God is cultivating something deep inside of you that is going to carry you into the next season. And when you move up in the next season, your character and your persistence in the word is going to move up with you so that you don't fall off the platform when you get there. You see, those times when you kindled the fire in the night seasons are the times that you're going to look back and say, wow, that was the most important moment of my life. And I thought I was just going about my daily routine. You know, I've heard preached a lot, and I even know there's songs like about going through the motions. Sometimes the right thing to do is go through the motions. Because if you go through the motions that are parallel with what God tells you to do in the scripture, even when you don't feel anything, going through those motions is exactly what God wants you to do. Right. Yeah. I don't feel like coming to church today, but I got up and went. Amen. I didn't feel like singing today, but I sang. I didn't feel like praising the Lord, but I praised Him. Even though you were going through the motions, I promise you that praise was not going unheard. Those prayers that you prayed that you thought God didn't hear, I bet you oftentimes those are the prayers that God answers. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder... If God doesn't answer more of our prayers when we feel nothing than he does when we're just all feeling goosebumps and praising the Lord. I, you know, I don't know about you, but when I'm in God's presence, I don't really care if he answers my prayers because I feel so good and so peaceful in that moment. But it's those times when you do the right thing and you're praying and you're like, God. Man, I feel like I'm boring myself to death praying this prayer, but I know it's the right thing to do because your word says it. God doesn't see that as empty prayer. Now, if your heart's in the wrong place and you're doing things out of wrong motives, that's a different story. But I'm talking about people that you're praying because I know this is the right thing to do. I came to prayer meeting because I knew it's the right thing to do. Those are the people I believe that God is continually kindling a fire in you that is going to be a fire that explodes and it gets on everybody else. But it's the people who are doing the right things now when they don't feel anything that are going to feel a whole lot of things later on in the next season. Amen. Praise you, Lord. You see... People often write stories and make movies about big moments in someone's life. But what the stories often miss is the little moment that no one saw that made the big moment memorable for all. You see, when we watch movies on TV, we see the highlights of the story. When we see sports teams on TV, we see the highlights of them winning great victories. But what we don't see is that Tuesday morning at 6 o'clock when they wanted to keep hitting the snooze button, but they didn't hit it and they got up and they got outside and they exercised, but it was only 15 degrees that day, but they still got up and went outside and ran. It's those moments that make those athletes in the fourth quarter with 30 seconds to go have that extra boost of energy that gives them the, the ability to gain advantage over their opponent. And what I will tell you tonight, relating that spiritually, it's those little moments where you kept the fire burning. It's those little moments where you kept praying. It's those little moments where you kept praising the Lord that gave you the strength to beat the enemy down the road. Amen. David defeated a lion and a bear. Some people at that time might have thought, oh, that's nothing. He's just a shepherd boy. He got lucky. But David took those little moments and said, because I, through the power of God, defeated the lion and the bear. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You see, when you face little bitty mountains and then you stand up before the big mountain, you got to still remember I won victory through the power of God over those little mountains. So I'm going to stand up to the big mountain, too, and I'm going to win that one, too. Think about those times in your life. Think sometimes you get diagnosed with things that are scary. Let's just say someone's diagnosed with cancer. If they have learned how to tap into God's healing when they had a headache or when they had a backache, going before cancer, they're saying, I know how to win in God's strength. 
So cancer, you're just a mountain that's going to have to move out of the way in the name of the Lord. What I'm trying to tell you tonight, it's the little things that make your life what it is. We think it's the big things, but it's not. Because the little things produce the results that we see in the big things. I was trying to think about the Lord Jesus and how I could relate what I'm telling you tonight to what he went through in his life. I said, was there any little moments that Jesus had in his life that we all kind of gloss over and forget about? And I started thinking, I was like, well, he turned the water into wine. That's a big moment. Man, he, he walked on the water. That's a big moment. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. He died on the cross and, and said, it is finished. He fought the battle in the garden and overcame and won. And I was thinking, man, I can't think of any little moments that Jesus had. But then God reminded me of a scripture in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. So I'm going to turn there really quick here tonight to Luke chapter 2, verse 40. It's verse 40 through 49, if you're taking notes tonight. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, this is speaking of Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So Jesus is 12. When they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Verse 46 says, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him was astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you dealt thus with us? Behold, your father and I have sought you sorrowing. We've been afraid about where you were, Jesus. We couldn't find you. And Jesus said to them, How is it that you sought me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? So Jesus, at 12 years old, said, I'm going to be about my father's business. I'm going to get in, in company with my father, and I'm going to work the trade that he works. And I say that because that was a little seemingly insignificant moment in comparison to everything else Jesus did. But he said, I'm going to do what my father tells me to do. I'm going to be about my father's business. So we jump on down to Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. And I want to show you how that verse about the Father's business connects with Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. It says in verse 35, And the same day when evening was come, Jesus said unto his disciples, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent the multitude away, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder parts of the ship, asleep on a pillow. So there's a great storm going on. The disciples who were fishermen who had been in boats were afraid because this was a big storm and the boat was seemingly sinking. And Jesus was laying in the back of the ship asleep because he had worked so hard in ministry that day, he was tired. So we go on reading, it says, And they said, They awoke him and said unto him, Master, do you not care that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they were 
They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So Jesus says back in Luke at the beginning of his life, 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. So we know that when we get to Mark chapter 4, that his father spoke to him and said, Jesus, I want you and your disciples to go to the other side. Jesus knew he was tired, and what most of us do when we're tired is say, all right, God, I'll go tomorrow. I'll go tomorrow, but just let me rest in my bed tonight, and I'll go do it tomorrow. But Jesus is about his father's business from back when he was 12, so he had built something up in himself that he said, the father said, go, I'm going to tell everybody to go. So he says, we're going to the other side. Jesus gets into the boat. He falls asleep. The boat starts fighting the storm. Do you think that God knew there was going to be a storm in the sea at that moment before he sent Jesus and the disciples over? Do you think God was up in heaven sweating, saying, oh, goodness, the Messiah is asleep and they're all going to drown? Oh, man, why did I make that decision? Why did I do that? Oh, man, this coronavirus has came. I, I was hoping that wouldn't happen because it's going to destroy my church. Man, I wish that wouldn't have happened. That's not how God thought at all. You see, God gave Jesus the command knowing that the disciples and Jesus were to go to the other side. Because Jesus had a relationship with his father and he was always about his father's business, he knew when the father gave the command, that means it was so. It was going to happen. We're going to do it. So they woke Jesus up and he says, peace be still. And he rebuked the wind and the waves. And then the next thing out of his mouth was, why are y'all so afraid? Do you think that he's saying that to the church right now? Why are you all so afraid of everything? Why do you believe everything you hear on TV? You used to question it until coronavirus came, and now you think it must be true. Why are you so fearful? Why are you so afraid? Why did Jesus say that to his disciples? Because he gave the command on the other side, let's go to the other side. So what he was saying was, I don't care what comes up in opposition on our way to the other side. We will get to the other side. He was basically saying to his disciples, why didn't y'all tell the wind and the waves to stop that we were on a mission to do the Father's business? You see, when you have the heart of Jesus and you're about the Father's business, it doesn't matter what obstacles come in your way. You know that if God gave the word and if God gave the command, we're going to the other side. Whether we've got to walk on water or not, we will get to the other side. And you see, the disciples had not had that revelation of we're about the Father's business, and we know the Father always tells the truth. And we know the Father's always got things figured out. They didn't have that figured out. So when the storm came and the winds came, they thought, oh, no, we're going to die with the Messiah on board with us. Jesus wanted them to respond and say, you better stop it right now, wind. You stop it. God told us we're going to the other side. You will not sink this ship. But he had to get up out of bed. And go up and stop this because his disciples didn't understand that when God gives a command, it will come to pass. If you will act on it and move with it. So my point tonight is that seemingly insignificant moment of Jesus saying, don't you know, mama, i got to be about daddy's business. That little moment birthed something in him. It talks about in verse 40 of Luke 2 that Jesus grew in wisdom and the grace of God was on him. He developed a relationship with his father at 12 years old and younger so that when he got up to the wind and the waves, he knew, I know everything my daddy says comes to pass, so I'm moving with it. And he rebuked the wind and the waves. Yes, he was the son of God, but Jesus says, I only do what I see my father already doing. That's what you develop in the small, keep the fire burning moments of your life. You develop ears to hear. You develop eyes to see. Because you learn for a long time, I hadn't seen anything, God. I hadn't heard anything, God. But there will come a moment while you're kindling that fire that you will hear the voice of the Lord. And when you hear the voice of the Lord, you'll start to hear it more. And you'll start to learn that when God speaks, what you used to think was just you making stuff up actually is the voice of God giving you direction and giving you guidance. 
But you learn in the quiet, little, insignificant moments, God really does talk to me. God really does direct my life. God really does give me advice because he speaks to my spirit. You know, I learned this a long time ago as a Christian, and it's hard to learn. When God speaks to me, it sounds like my voice. And I thought, I thought I'd hear some deep, many waters sounding voice on the inside and then know it's God. I thought that I'd feel goosebumps all over me. And sometimes you do. But most of the time, you do not. That's right. yeah. Why does God's voice sound a lot like your voice? Because God communicates with you in your spirit. That's right. So when God speaks to my spirit, my spirit tells my understanding what God has just said. And that's why it bubbles up from my spirit into my intellect, my mind. And it sounds like, Lucas, you need to go here or do this. And I'm thinking... That sounds an awful lot like me, and I made it up. But if you'll learn how to tarry in prayer, you'll learn how to distinguish the, the thoughts that are just coming like birds flying over your head and the thoughts that come and they move in. And it's almost like it's almost like when you really hear from God, something starts down in you and it bubbles up into your understanding. It's like it starts in a deep place, and you're like, I don't know about you all, but when I'm reading the scripture or I know God's about to speak to me, there's something in me that says, God's trying to tell me something right now. God's trying to say something to me. I don't quite know what it is, but I know he's speaking. And it's like as I keep pressing into him, it starts bubbling up and bubbling up until eventually it gets in my brain. And then I'm like, oh, that's it. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Oh, God, I've been praying for weeks on what that scripture meant. And you just bubbled it up from the inside. That's how God speaks. I'll have a feeling when I'm reading a scripture and I'll say, I know there's something in this verse and I have no idea what it is right now, but I feel like there's something in it. And as you tarry with God in those moments, that's when he unravels those things in the scripture and they come to your understanding. Of, oh, I get it now. I get it. That's the best way I know how to describe his voice. I hope that's helpful to you all tonight. But we see that Jesus was about the Father's business, so he was able to do great things. Let me give you one other example. Have you ever seen the movie Karate Kid? Yeah. Me and Amber watched it about a month or so ago. Karate Kid's a good movie. If you've never watched it, you should. It's, it always encourages me to go out and fight those bullies because I can do it in the strength of the Lord. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. <laughs> Dave's going to my point here. So, in the movie Karate Kid... There was this boy named Danielson that kept getting bullied by these other guys. And he was getting bullied and beat up, and he's like, man, I don't want to live here anymore. Every time I go to school, I'm scared that I'm going to get beat up in a fight. And so he's got this maintenance man named Mr. Miyagi uh, that lives near him. And so there's one night that Danielson actually picks a fight with the guys by, I think, pouring water on their heads through the sink in the bathroom, and they go chase him and steer in a Halloween scene, and they end up catching him and kicking his butt, but then some magical man shows up and beats all those boys up and rescues Danielson, and that magic man is little old Mr. Miyagi. Talk about seemingly small and insignificant. He's short and he's really old, but he knows how to do karate. So you might say tonight, I'm too old to accomplish God's purpose. I'm too small to speak what God has given me to say. Why don't you be like Mr. Miyagi? He knew karate and you know the Holy Spirit. So if you know the Holy Spirit, you can tap into the things of God and pull them out no matter how old or young you are. Right. There's no excuse. I'm too young, God. God said, Jeremiah, you're not too young. I'm too old, God. No, you're not. The Holy Spirit renews you every day. You get up and you speak what God's given you. But we see that Mr. Miyagi tells Danielson, all right, Danielson, I'm going to rescue you and save you. They end up going and pretty much picking another fight with the karate instructor, and they got to fight in this tournament. Danielson's never done karate, but he's got to fight in a karate tournament against the guys that have been beating him up, trying to make this short. So Mr. Miyagi takes him and says, I will teach you karate, Danielson. The first thing he has him do is wax his car. That's the very first thing. Just like Dave said, wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. So Danielson spends a whole evening waxing his car. 
Mr. Miyagi's car, not his car. And that's all he did that whole evening was wax on, wax off. He comes back the next day thinking, oh, man, he's going to teach me something today. He teaches him how to sand the floor. Sand, 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 sand. And he does his whole, like, back deck. And I don't know about you, but by that moment, I'd be getting frustrated. He comes in the next day thinking, all right, man, I learned my lesson, Mr. Miyagi. Will you teach me karate? He says, paint the fence. Paint the fence, paint the fence. That's all he did. Paint the fence, paint the fence. So, Mr. Miyagi, the only thing I've learned from you is that I know how to do all your chores. I waxed on, I waxed off, I sanded the floor, and I painted your fence. What do you want from me now? So he gets to this breaking point, and I want you to relate this to your life because you've been there. I've been there before, too. God has you doing these seemingly insignificant tasks, and you're like, God, this don't make any sense. Why are you asking me to do this? And you get to that breaking point, and Danielson got there, and Mr. Miyagi started grabbing his attention and fighting him with karate. And so the very things that Mr. Miyagi taught Danielson to do, wax on, wax off, paint the fence, Mr. Miyagi showed Danielson that those were the foundational techniques of doing karate. You defend the enemy. You block him with your hand. You attack. He taught him how to do karate through insignificant Things that were monotonous and mundane and he didn't want to do. But he learned how to do karate because those little tasks got on the inside of him to where they became so second nature that when Mr. Miyagi attacked, he waxed on. He waxed off. And I wonder tonight for you, what is God doing with you that you're sick and tired of doing? That he is developing something inside of you that you're going to use to win battles in his kingdom. Yes. What is God having you do in this moment that you are so sick and tired of doing that you say, God, if I have to kindle the fire on this altar one more day, I'm going to give it up. And then you get to that breaking point and God comes through and shows you, Jacob, I've been doing this all along to get you to turn from your ways and get saved. People, God is working on our hearts, but he's doing it through the, the little bitty things, the little bitty clouds, the things that don't make any sense, the things that, you know all those times you came to church and nobody else did? You know all those times you came and you showed up and other people didn't? You know all those times you held your tongue when you really thought you couldn't have done it, but you held it? Those times were strengthening you. So that you can accomplish the goal that God has for you in your life. I realized that when Jesus was 12 and he was about the father's business, that little thing is what set him free when he was in the garden sweating blood and able to say, not my will, but yours be done. I got in business with you, father, a long time ago, and I've learned by obedience how to walk with you. I've learned by obedience how to put my trust in you. I've learned to obey you when I felt nothing, God. And it's because of those moments that now I'm able to obey you in front of the multitude of people. It's the little things I'm telling you that stir you for the future. Yes, amen. So you say tonight to me, Lucas, I appreciate all that, but it still doesn't make it easy. No, you're right. It doesn't make it easy. But now I want to give you some wisdom from God. The Lord's talking to the servants watching the house of God at night. And this is what he says. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. This is what God says to you and to me. You might feel frustrated. You might feel tired. Lift up your hands and bless the Lord. Let praise be on your lips. In those moments where you're struggling, open your mouth and just say, I praise you, Jesus. I bless the Lord. I thank you, Lord. You're a wonderful God. You're a good God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And as you praise the Lord, he draws near to you. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We've been having prayer meetings on Monday, and I tell you, you can come in and be as dry 
as a bone that's been chewed on and licked and it's just been laid out in the sun. It's dry, dry. You can come in here on Monday nights and what we start out our prayer meetings with is just praise the Lord. I praise you, God. I glorify you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. This is the day that you have made. You're a wonderful God. You're a powerful God. Praise you, Jesus. We lift you on high. We glorify you. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And as we do that, we draw into the heart of the Father. And we move into the prayer meetings that we have. And then we leave saying, man, I feel peaceful. I feel great. But it's because we started praising the Lord. You see, God told us in Psalm 134, that measly little three-verse psalm. Lift up your hands, temple workers. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And as you bless the Lord, this is what happens in verse 3. The Lord, Yahweh, that made heaven and earth, bless you. Yeah. As I bless him, he's like, man, I, I love it when you bless me, but I'm the kind of God that what, what you sow, I let you reap. So if you're blessing me, I'm going to bless you. Right. So as God's pouring up his praise to you, I see God's hand going here. Take some of my love. Take some of my power. Take some of my joy. Take some of my peace. And as you're going, praise the Lord. God's taking his hand and putting peace in you. And putting joy in you. And putting love in you. And putting grace in you. He's giving you strength when you had no strength. He's giving you encouragement when you felt defeated. As I bless the Lord, the Lord blesses is me. That's what I've learned. And I thank you God for that. Praise you Lord. Hallelujah. It says in Hebrews 13 and 15, by him, Jesus, let us therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. The sacrifice of praise to God continually. you got to keep the fire burning continually. So the only way to keep the fire burning continually is offer the sacrifice of praise continually. Yeah. But he doesn't stop there in that verse. He puts, that is, comma, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Your sacrifice of praise is praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for how good you've been to me. I praise you, God. And as you do those things, he pours into you as you do them. Yes. Praise you, Lord. Praise God. I want to close with the scripture that uh, David spoke about on Sunday. Romans 12 and 1. Romans 12 and 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The brazen altar where we're talking about keeping the fire burning, that's where the sacrifice was burnt before the Lord. And what we become is living sacrifices to God. You say, God, I'm going to keep the fire burning in my life because I'm going to continually offer myself on your altar. Yeah. I'm going to continually offer me to you, God. Use me how you want. Do what you want in my life. I lay my heart on your altar, God. And as you praise him and magnify him, when you feel nothing, that's when God sees you're laying yourself before him, putting yourself beyond your emotions and saying, God, I'm yours. I'm coming before you because I'm yours. God, use me how you want to. Do what you want to, God. Here am I. Send me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to you, God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. We are that living sacrifice, and we lay it before you, God. We bless your name, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God.